Chapter 2. The Butterfly Effect Paul turned and gave a last look at Alex before following Robert through the door. Alex was close behind as they all re-entered the pool yard. There they were met by the sight of Luis being loaded onto a stretcher, a white blanket wrapped around him at the waist. The rest of the crew were scattered but close by, all drawn to every motion made by authorities. Benny hid by the fence furthest from everyone else, and Dalton stood with the rest by the coolers while they casually ate their lunch. As the two reached Luis, he rolled his head to the side and exchanged a look with his boss. It was clear by the pensive look on his face that he harbored rational anger behind his furrowed brows, but seemed reluctant to speak. The cop that stood closest to him was leaning uncomfortably close, but pulled himself away as the two approached. He now turned his body to them and addressed Paul with neutral urgency. Morning, sir. Are you the one in charge? He asked with a soft voice. The cop was somewhere around his early thirties with a buttery smooth face and long eyelashes. His large cheekbones and plush lips made him appear much too pretty to serve as any intimidating or otherwise enforcing figure. He nodded in response. Paul Lecker, officer. I was just interviewing one of my crew to get an understanding of the situation. The cop kept a keen eye on Alex, and pretty quickly his demeanor changed. He switched from routine cop-on-call to entirely defensive, almost livid. The judgmental stare he threw toward the awkwardly leaning offender only served to create a static tension between the two. Alex was not one to be scrutinized, and he made that clear by tightening his demeanor to indicate he would not be judged. His eyes returned to Paul. In that case, I'd love to compare stories. Your guy here says he tripped and fell into the pool. Is there any truth to that? His tone was far too insinuating. Paul knew immediately what this guy was about, but played ignorant. Instead, turning to Alex and gestured him to explain. Well, you were there. Why don't you explain what happened? Alex also kept his cool, going through the motions of a police confrontation. Hands by his side, fists open and relaxed. However, he made sure to keep his right hand turned away from his view, attempting to conceal the split knuckle in blood. Knowing full well that the bruises on his face and Luis's ripped earlobe couldn't be explained easily. Still hazy, Alex cleared his throat and attempted to bring forth saliva to his wet lips. A quick glance to the prone Luis confirmed their approach. With a harsh breath through his nose, Alex spoke confidently. It's true. It was just an accident. Most of the guys were getting ready to take lunch, so they didn't see it firsthand. Luis and I were talking when he walked over to the poolside to grab something. I made a comment about his mother, so he turned to respond, but kept walking backwards. That's when he tripped and fell in. It was quiet again. The cop had his hands on his hips now, both eyes squinted and his lips comically pursed. The paramedic stood on either side of the stretcher, waiting to take him away. The cop then snickered and looked to Luis, then back to them. Well, that's more of an elaboration than I got, he stated, then pressed for more information. What about his hand? I'm no doctor, but looks like it could be broken. Alex smirked. I guess we should let them come to a conclusion, seeing as they are doctors. His face got a little red with anger, but he took a deep breath and hummed with a smile. Paul interrupted. Officer, as much as his mouth may get ahead of him, he's right, and these men have a job to do. He gestured, but the cop didn't break eye contact. In silence, he lowered his arms and took a few steps in his direction, getting in real close. Alex didn't back away or show any hostility anywhere except for his eyes. They were locked, merely inches apart. The cop took a deep breath through his nose, and at the same instance, Alex held his back. Say, Mr. Avery, he addressed him by name, an insinuative tone lathered on his tongue. Have you been drinking today? The atmosphere switched just like that going from uncomfortable to suffocating in seconds. A smirk crept onto Alex's face, and he responded, No, sir. His words were hollow, distanced by the apparent one-sided familiarity the cop had with him. Paul stood on the side impatiently, and finally became fed up with the situation. Officer? He said calmly, but received no acknowledgement. He and Alex just stood there, mad-dogging each other. Paul was not one to accept being ignored, so he aggressively snapped his fingers, demanding attention. I don't believe I caught your name, he demanded. He stifled another breath and complied. So sorry, I'm Officer Mark Clancy. His accent snuck between his teeth as he gave a polite nod and extended his hand, to which Paul accepted. He then backed away and looked to Alex one last time, then to the paramedics, giving them a nod. 
But before the cart was pulled away, Paul placed his hand on the side and addressed Luis. Make sure you call me as soon as you can so we can figure out what to do about work. Luis replied, Yeah, yeah. The paramedics pushed him back down the path alongside the building, quickly disappearing from sight. There was an exhaustingly long minute and a half where Officer Clancy just lingered around, looking into the pool and observing the crew. He searched for the words or motive to push further, but came up empty-handed, thankfully missing blood droplets from the fight. There was a lingering silence that everyone could pick apart before Clancy decided to speak up. Well, Mr. Ecker, I will surely be in contact. He then looked to Alex. And you, keep your hands to yourself. Alex gave a mocking salute, sneering. It was obvious he knew a fight happened, but he couldn't do much more than speculate. He took a retreating step and then went on his way, exiting through the gate. In his wake was a new stress in the air. Paul rubbed his forehead again and turned to address the rest of the crew. All right, everyone. I know we've had an exciting morning, but there's still work to be done. Take a long lunch, but I expect you all to carry the weight of your fallen comrade. I already dragged his ass out of the pool, shouted Dalton. And you'll be next if I don't see some fucking progress, he responded with a dagger finger. Everyone laughed and then came together for their lunch. Paul snickered to himself and turned back to Alex, who had been quiet. He sighed and went serious again, placing his hand on his shoulder. Come with me. He rolled his eyes, but followed him back inside the doors. As they re-entered the building, his ears became stuffy again from the enclosed quiet space. A harsh yawn was a quick remedy to his discomfort, then he placed himself back against the wall. Trying to defuse the tension, Alex spoke up. Man, I don't like that guy. I don't trust anyone with two first names. He half chuckled to himself. Paul gave a pity laugh, but went quiet briefly before speaking up. The clearing of his throat was the first warning of what was to come, followed by a slight stammering and a pang of general sadness in his voice. Look, I'm just going to get right to it. I'm going to have to let you go. His eyes widened, but his stiff lean remained. You can't be serious. Paul scoffed. You show up to work drunk half the time. You barely have a shred of respect, and you nearly killed one of my employees. What else do you want me to do? Alex pushed off the wall and tightened his shoulders, flipping into a controlled rage. Well, what the fuck do you want me to do, huh? Without this job, I lose everything. I lose my apartment, my car, all of it, gone. The fire in his eyes was matched only by the knot in his teeth. I don't have a choice. If that lie falls through and they find out what really happened... Alex puffed his chest, the anger rising within him. This isn't fucking funny, Paul. His fists clenched. Paul looked to his hand with ruffled brows. The air was filled with huffing and bated breath. On one side, he had all he could do not to grab this little potato man and throw him into the wall. All of his muscles screamed to break something, but the part of him that knew that was stupid, thankfully, kept it under wraps. Still, the seams of insanity ripped and spat hot air from his mouth as he started pacing side to side. I'll tell you what would happen. My company name will be on the chopping block for turning a blind eye to your intoxication. Those men out there will be shit out of luck, and Luis's family could still sue for damages. I still need to talk to Benny and make sure he keeps his mouth shut for now. The only way he does that is for you to be punished. But you can't. His body felt tired all at once. A mental fog rolled in and limited his ability to think. I'm sorry, kid. I wish there was something else I could do. The guilt in his voice was clear. He didn't want it to go this way. With clenched fists but relaxed shoulders, he tried his best to piece together a sentence, mustering a final plea. One last chance. Come on, just one more chance. Don't do this to me, kid. This isn't the end. You're... Paul mumbled to himself. What are you, 25? Yeah, you just had a pitiful birthday at Bruno's Bar. What I'm trying to say is you've got so much potential and so much time left. Just not here. The cold slap of reality thrashed his jaw, and his body went nearly limp with hopelessness. As if all the color on his body and clothes had melted off and pooled on the floor beneath his feet. He shuddered and spoke with an irate sigh. There has to be something I can do. Anything. Paul stammered, searching for a solution. I just... I don't see any... 
Suddenly, from the back of his churning brain, came a thought which stopped him in his tracks. Actually, you know what? I might just have something for you. His head rose and color returned to his eyes. I know a guy, Jim Cagney, who does contract work a couple towns over. He's the kind of guy who takes on ex-criminals being rehabilitated and sometimes juvie kids. He's a real upstanding guy who's always looking for a new batch of crazies. I think he'd be thrilled to throw you on his tool belt. The jobs he does are taken with the extent of fixing you. What do you mean by that? He got this cynical look on his face. What I mean is, while you were on the job site, you can't be showing up to work with even a hint of liquor on your breath. You can't even bring your smokes because almost all his jobs are on government-funded sites like schools, libraries, and shit like that. That way, if you fuck up, it's not a slap on the wrist. It goes straight to a federal offense. How the hell would they allow him to do that? What if he brings some rapist or something to a school? He shook his head. No, see, he rarely has extreme offenders like that. Rapists and murderers aren't doing community service. But... There is a huge pool of free labor to exploit in troubled youths and domestic abusers. Alex rubbed both hands together, wringing his fingers and cracking the knuckles. He let out a long, frustrated sigh and directed his eyes to the ground. What's the level of security for a job like this? I can't imagine he lets them wander unattended. I don't know everything, but he's got it all figured out. Alex huffed. I mean, shit, I guess I don't have a choice. That's not true. You could always work at a nail salon. Fuck off, Paul, Alex said with only a hint of playfulness. Now that I'm not your boss, I almost take offense to that, he smiled. Their ears rang with a brief silence. Heavy contemplation nodded Alex's mind and forced him to take a mental step back. It was a serene moment, a personal one. The abrupt end to an integral part of his life now shifted to a mysterious new path one that had many different possibilities and potentials. For the first time in a while, he was nervous, almost scared at what is to come. Paul extended one of his meaty hands to Alex, who met him halfway with a firm handshake. It was in this moment that a surge of nostalgia struck his chest. Sentimentality was not a dainty affair for him, but there are exceptions to every rule, even ones he set in place. Their relationship was unique. Not easily described in a word, but memorable in a way that would stick with him for the rest of his life. A surrogate father he now felt closure with, as his life was aimed in a new direction. A tingle in his gut forced him to release their mutual grip. A heavy thirst dried his tongue, and a familiar desire to tilt the bottle flooded him. This is why. This is the exact reason he drank. Memories triggered by potent emotions swelled, growing like mold at the rim of his sanity this new tragedy had contributed a fresh layer over the scab. Relating Paul to his own father, he was assigned a fragment of venomous disdain, enforcing the seething hatred for a ghost and others alike, which consistently throw him away. His half-confident grin slithered away, and his eyes displayed only grief behind the pale blue. A numbness pulled over his flesh as he tried to re-establish himself. Stuffing one hand in his back pocket, he sighed. Paul gave a wide, pleasant grin. You can help finish up today, and don't worry, you'll get paid all the same. After today, I suggest you go home and work on your manners, because I'll tell you what, Jim is not one to take any lip. He snickered, but had no comment. Paul could tell something had changed in him, but was unsure of exactly what he was stuck on. Don't worry, you won't be sitting on your ass for long. I'll give him a call as soon as I can, and he'll set you up with a gig within a week or two. He nodded, keeping his eyes unfocused. All right. Thanks for everything. It's what we do. Paul gave a smirk and gestured to the door. With a few heavy footsteps, he followed the stout man out of the building for the final time. Immediately, they were greeted by a chilling air that slipped through the gaps in the surrounding fence. The rest of the crew was sitting to the right of the door and back a few feet by the cooler, listening to the radio and finishing up their lunch. Alex separated himself and sat down by the rest of the crew while Paul zipped up his coat and addressed the workers. All right, everyone, here's the deal. Obviously, Luis is out of commission for the foreseeable future, and Avery just got a shiny new promotion to errand boy for Jim Cagney. Everyone give him a round of applause. They each began to clap their hands and cheer in a snide, sarcastic way. 
Alice couldn't help but grin as they all contributed to the ceremony, knowing full well that they understood he was let go. Very nice, Paul said plainly before continuing. So, after today, you will be down two men. I expect each of you to pick up the slack and get this job done on schedule. In the meantime, I'll do what I can to find someone that can meet their standards. If anyone has a teenage daughter or maybe even a babysitter, please tell her to bring me a W-2 and a signed permission slip. An uproar of laughter bolstered his eardrums, and Alex kept a smile across his lips, cherishing this moment and appreciating the love and respect everyone had for Paul. Despite this, a shroud of angst kept itself at the front of his thoughts. This feeling bothered him. The all-too-familiar dread that plagued his mind from six years ago was prominent once more, provoking a thirst and introducing a tremble in his chest. The laughter ceased, and just as Paul started talking again, Robert leaned over and handed Alex a sandwich from the cooler, which he accepted with a gracious head nod. In light of this, his tone shifted to serious, I want you all to consider the men beside you. Any quarrels or negativity should not go unannounced. If there's a problem, talk about it. Talk to each other or talk to me, but for God's sake, don't go cracking skulls. I expect you all to treat each other like family while on the job. Understand? Everyone nodded, their energy focused once more. Good. Now finish your lunch and get back to work. Double time. He commanded. Alex sat at the edge of the group next to Robert and unwrapped the sandwich from the foil. Taking a hefty bite of bologna soaked through with mayonnaise, he peered back up to Paul as he turned away and checked his pager, staring down at it as he walked away, disappearing through the gate.